for working on the uh, areas related to uh, law and social transformation. The, the team is the uh, tradition uh, uh, and the law, uh, tradition, law and social transformation in Bengal. Uh, Bengal is a pioneer in the effort of uh, social transformation, relay science and other things. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Honorable Justice Chitosh Mukherjee, Honorable uh, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, esteemed uh, faculty members, esteemed uh, guests, and esteemed uh, invitees, students, and friends. Today, we have a Mr. Uh, esteemed uh, scholar a person who has uh, known for uh, a very high profile in administration, governmental service, Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi, who will be delivering Ashtosh Mukherjee lecture. We have a chair constituted by the state government of uh, West Bengal for uh, studying the Bengal tradition, law and social transformation and uh, that a chair is established in the name of uh, Sir Ashtosh Mukherjee. You might be aware that uh, Ashtosh Mukherjee had uh, uh, contributed significantly to various uh, spheres of life. It is uh, the sphere of uh, law, justice, human rights, politics, education and uh, uh, his uh, thoughts about the uh, welfare of uh, women or uh, welfare of uh, uh, workers or uh, uh, welfare of uh, children that is uh, exhibited in a number of his uh, judgments. About the uh, concept of law and justice uh, he had uh, a very distinct uh, view and uh, he had a scholarly understanding about the active rule of law, how law is a, not a mere legal norm, but a, it is a, an instrument of a bringing a social transformation, bringing a, a desirable change, and a planned change of a, the society is a possible through the application of law. That was a, his a, understanding of law and justice. When uh, the government of uh, West Bengal was approached by us uh, to have a grant, the government uh, readily sanctioned a good corpus amount and out of uh, the income earned, we are organizing series of uh, programs. It might be seminars or uh, conferences or uh, even uh, these days of uh, special lectures. It was in uh, 2015 that uh, it was uh, started. And uh, in uh, 2016, we have a full-fledged uh, visiting professor for uh, undertaking various uh, activities of uh, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee Chair, uh, Mr. Sudesh Bhai, a very eminent uh, uh, scholar uh, in the field of uh, Ashutosh Mukherjee studies. And uh, he has uh, uh, authored a uh, number of uh, books relating to 
biography and uh, uh, other contributions of uh, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee. The theme of uh, the, ch the chair is a uh, law, Bengal law, Bengal tradition, law and social trans transformation. Uh, from the 1850s, we come across uh, such a, a big movement, which uh, ultimately uh, wakened up the society. We had uh, very eminent uh, leaders, Swami Vivekananda, or uh, Ashtosh Mukherjee, or uh, Rabindranath Tagore, or uh, various uh, other scholars uh, who led the whole movement towards uh, the awakening process. Today we have Mr. Gopakrishna Gandhi, about whom uh, my colleague will be introducing elaborately. But let me uh, tell you that uh, he was uh, born in 1945. Uh, he was a grandson of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, son of uh, Devadas Gandhi and Lakshmi Gandhi. And uh, uh, he has uh, contributed significantly to literature, to various uh, spheres, and uh, he was a uh, vice president. He was a uh, secretary to vice president, and uh, uh, he was a uh, governor of uh, West Bengal. As a governor of West Bengal, uh, he made uh, a very big name as a uh, very valuable advisor to all of uh, the polity. It's a uh, quite a uh, fortunate that uh, he had agreed to deliver uh, Ashutosh Mukherjee lecture on the theme, India 2025. We have to look ahead and uh, how by India, uh, by 2025, India will be facing various uh, types of uh, situations and uh, how our uh, present preparedness uh, will be enabling us to face that type of uh, situation and uh, uh, what should be our uh, preparation and uh, what should be our efforts and uh, how it is uh, likely to contribute towards uh, the overall development of uh, the society for a long time. About that uh, uh, he will be contributing, he will be speaking. On behalf of uh, National University of Judicial Science, on behalf of uh, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee Chair, let me heartily welcome uh, Honorable uh, Mr. Gopalakrishna Gandhi. Uh, sir, uh, your uh, presence has uh, uh, actually enabled us to have this kind of uh, uh, lecture. Uh, we heartily welcome you. Uh, I heartily welcome uh, uh, Justice uh, Chitosh Mukherjee, who is the grandson of uh, uh, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee. Chitosh Mukherjee is a, a great name in uh, Calcutta. He is a father figure in the field of uh, legal world today in uh, Calcutta. He was a former Chief Justice of uh, Calcutta High Court as well as uh, Bombay High Court. And uh, his uh, contribution to the uh, development of uh, the university, NUGS, is uh, great from the very inception of uh, the university to perhaps uh, 2013, he was associated with the governance of uh, the institution and uh, his uh, guidance, his uh, uh, contribution and his uh, participation and uh, his uh, devotion and uh, uh, his work had uh, actually contributed towards uh, the development of uh, the university and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, NUJS, on behalf of uh, the chair, uh, let me heartily welcome uh, Honorable mm -hmm. Justice uh, Chitosh Mukherjee. Uh, with this, uh, I will uh, ask my friend, uh, uh, yes, uh, that uh, we are going to day to introduce Gopal uh, uh, It gives me very great pleasure to be able to invite and welcome the Honorable former Governor of West Bengal, Shri Gopal Krishna Gandhi, to the NUJS, my university. And 
It is our pleasure that he has agreed to speak on India in 2025, which is an extremely important topic for all of us, especially law students and social science researchers. I have been asked to introduce Sri Gandhi. Apart from being the former governor of West Bengal, he is one of our IAS officers who has done extremely good work in, with regard to the Tamil Nadu Gazetteer as well as some very, very good books that he has edited and published on his grandfather Mahatma Gandhi as well as in literature. To me his three books, one play on Dara Shuko and his grandfather Mahatma Gandhi which is called A Frank Friendship which he published while he was here in Calcutta from 2004 to 2009 are extremely important. A Frank Friendship details out Gandhi's days in Calcutta, his visits to Calcutta from, 18, from the 1890s to 1947. And I think that book does throw very great light on the history of the national movement, especially Gandhi's involvement with Bengal. Sri Gandhi is also one of our finest as administrators, having been an ambassador in a number of countries as well as having been a director of the Nehru Center in London. I think I will not take up much of your time anymore. I will invite Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi to come and deliver his lecture. Justice Chitatosh Mukherjee, I am honored to be sharing a dais with you. Sri Chitatosh Mukherjee is not only a tiring figure in the world of the law, but is also a person of extraordinary wisdom and maturity. And I uh, am personally beholden to him for many acts of kindness and guidance which he was kind enough to extend to me when I was working in the state until 2010. Mr. Vice Chancellor, I thank you for having invited me to this gathering to give the Ashutosh Memorial Lecture. I am aware of the fact that the name and image and stature of Ashutosh Mukherjee requires no elucidation to any audience in India, particularly in Kolkata, beyond what is already known of him and cherished. But I would like to say one thing about him which all of us are aware of, but perhaps needs uh, periodical re-emphasis which is this, that while he was all that he was in the corridors of justice, and he did all that he did in the institutions of education, it is really what he did in society to change some of its stubborn ways that is so extraordinary about him. The way he took upon himself the task of explaining to society what widow remarriage entails and what it means and what it should do, consequent upon the tragedy that befell his daughter Komala, is what I personally treasure him the most for. Societies throughout all their evolutions have people who conserve its traditions, have people who challenge those traditions, and have people who just take that society forward exponentially by 10, 20, 30, 100 years. It is very few people to whom this opportunity is given. He was one of those. 
he challenged society to stop being chained and shackled to tradition when that tradition was so manifestly and patently inimical to the welfare of individuals, categories, and in this case, to India's womankind. It is right, it is customary, it is also universal for any society to want to be proud of itself, to its, of its country. And there is no reason why we should not be. I think we have more reason than most to be very proud of our tradition, of our societies, and of our country. But I think it is important for us to know that there is so much in India that is requiring of a completely different reaction from us. Pride, yes. But pride which is blind to the faults of our society is not pride, it is just arrogance. It is in fact worse than arrogance and I will not venture descriptions of what it really is. Essentially, Nehru was very right when he said that there are few countries which have so much that is truly noble about them. And there are few countries which have so much that is truly disgusting about them, as India. And I think we have to keep both truths together. I am sure many of you are students of literature as much as you are students of law. And you must have heard of uh, this famous description of the painter Salvador Dali by, by George Orwell in, in a very remarkable essay called The Benefit of Clergy. Salvador Dali's paintings are, 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 are worth seeing many, many times over for both what uh, they, they, they do to impress you and what they do to shock you. But George Orwell said that one has to remember about Salvador Dali, that he was a consummate artist and a rotten human being. He was both. And one must remember this, because uh, the biography of uh, Salvador Dali is um, unreadable without a sense of disgust. And I think it is important for all of us to cultivate a sense of awe, a sense of appreciation, of admiration, but also the readiness to be provoked, disturbed, indeed enraged by what is happening around us. I do not need to recount the things which may disgust ourselves as a people. Uh, you know them as well as anybody else does. But I would like to, to take this chance to, to share a few concerns about, about the way we are before I venture to say what we may be ten years from now. I think it's, it is a truism that uh, India has uh, become so ridiculously uh, overpopulated that it is uh, literally eating itself up. I think there is something to be said for that. But we must also realize that there are two sides to this. If we are extraordinarily large and bulky, it is something which is a fact. And yesterday at the, at the Lit Fest in, in Kolkata, this question was asked uh, by, by a member of the audience. Isn't our population uh, hideously big? And are we doing any, anything about it? Have we stopped talking about the, the problems raised by uh, population growth? And uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, who was in the audience, gave a very game reply. He said, yes, the population of India is growing exponentially. It is a problem. But it is not the population of India that is the problem. But it is the consumption levels that is the problem. You can have, as in China, a very medium population growth rate. but accompanied by an extraordinary increase in what that population is doing to the pollution of China. And China's contribution to the pollution of the world was at its maximum when its population was stable. So in India too, the population of India, which is growing a huge, huge rate, is, is, is not in itself the problem. The population of India is a problem because its contribution via consumption levels to the pollutions that we are seeing in the world and which we are now feeling increasingly on our skins is the problem. But this is like any other major issue, only one side of the issue. What is really true about the population of India? And this reminds me of a very 
George Orwell-like situation again, in which not a person who was a writer, but a simple journalist called Tazi Vitachi of Sri Lanka, uh, he has written about. And Tazi Vitachi says that no Lankan or no Bangladeshi or Pakistani, Maldivian or Nepali likes to be mistaken for an Indian when abroad. It is very standard for a person from the subcontinent of India to be taken to be an Indian. And Bangladeshis and Sri Lankans and Pakistanis don't like to be mistaken for the largest country, in, mistaken to be a citizen of the largest country on the subcontinent of India because they have their own country, they have their own pride. Tazi Vitachi was asked in a New York taxi by the New York taxi man, looking at him through the rear view mirror, are you from the country where they breed like rabbits? So normally Tazi Vitachi would have said, if you mean India, I am not an Indian. But something Asian in him was stoked because he felt this was a rebuff to Asia. So he said, wait a minute. And identifying himself for the moment of that discussion with India, he said, I am not from the country where they breed like rabbits, but I am from the country where they don't die like flies anymore. And this was a remarkable correction of what uh, the taxi man had in his mind. The huge exponential increase in our population is, is not so much because we are breeding like rabbits, but because our death rate has fallen down. And this is a huge compliment and a tribute to, to India. And this is a tribute to, to the Republic of India, because this is something which has happened after independence. We have increased our population, but it's more because the death rate has fallen than because the birth rate has spread. And this is, a, is something we should truly be proud about. But is that enough for us? Is pride in a matter like this enough? I think in a, in a broad sweep, umbrule, back of the envelope sense, there are three things about which India is truly admired in the world. Three things representative. It doesn't mean there aren't a fourth or a fifth. It doesn't mean that these three are probably the most important than any others. But these three things are among those things for which India is, is, is regarded as it is regarded in the world. I would say the first of these is, and this is very simplistic, you are all into highly advanced studies of the law and you have read huge tomes, many of them are bound in, in, in leather and half calf and you're going to be intellectual leaders of India. So you will probably find some of these descriptions very simplistic. But the fact is, three things which stand out about India, one, the Taj Mahal. The third, MKG, as some of us like to describe the Mahatma. And the third, most important, first Taj Mahal, MKG, and the third, India's democracy. And it's not necessarily in that order, and these are not the only three things about which we are celebrated. But these are among the three things which we are celebrated about. I think they are probably the most easily recognizable three things. But these three things are not just those three things. The Taj is not about just one beautiful building, which Tagore very memorably and unforgettably described as teardrop on the cheek of time. I think nobody else could have described the Taj as beautifully as, as Tagore did. When he described it as the teardrop on the cheek of time. Which reminds me of another incident which we have to be aware of. And which in a way links to some of the things I was mentioning about Ashutosh Mukherjee. The Vice President of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, and his wife, who was a very active feminist, Zenile Mbeki, came to see the Taj when on a state visit to India, like most people do. And as soon as they entered, and I was on duty because I was working then in the Indian Nation in South Africa, and I was able to hear this. As soon as they entered the outer gate of the Taj, the guide welcomed them, saying, Welcome, Your Excellencies. Welcome to the greatest mausoleum on earth. This is where lies Mumtaz Mahal, mother of Shah Jahan's 14 children who died in the birth of her 14th child. 
And Zanina Mbeki, who is a great feminist, she stood back and she said, what? 14 children? And she died giving birth to the 14th? I'm not going in. <laughs> and she turned around to go back. When Thabo Mbeki went up to her and said, Zanile, in those days, having 14 children was not such an unusual thing. And she was a tenderly loved wife. Come in. And Zanile went in. But the fact is, the fact is, that the Taj Mahal, the world's greatest mausoleum, is also where lies this woman, Mumtaz Mahal. And if you were to forget Mumtaz Mahal as the wife of Shah Jahan, but also think of the fact that Mumta, if in a very clinical and medical sense, purely medical, she died of postpartum hemorrhage, giving birth to her 14th child. Now this is about India's womanhood. This is not about Mumta's man. This does not take away from the beauty of the Taj. But we have to be able to take all things together. Pride, agony. Admiration, disappointment. Or disgust. Everything in India has to be seen in its totality. So if we have the Taj, we also have the fact that the Taj is also the story of India's womankind, which is taken for granted by Indian men. But there is more to the Taj than just the story of a man and a woman. The Taj is also the symbol, a very, very precious and now increasingly precious symbol of India's secularism. And I think today, just as it is vital to preserve and protect the, the welfare, the well-being, the dignity and the, and the sense of being a person in India's womankind, it is very important for us to be aware of the huge threat that is faced by Indian secularism. And I think Omurthy Babu was absolutely right when he said the other day, I think two days ago in Kolkata, that secularism is, is almost now mentioned by certain quarters as a, as a dirty word. Perhaps liberty will soon be mentioned as a dirty word. Perhaps, in, in, perhaps tolerance will be mentioned in certain quarters as a dirty word. But is it really? I think we have to be very, very conscious of the fact that secularism is the political nomenclature given to a certain tradition in India, which is a very old tradition of, of mutual respect. And it is not just mutual respect, a kind of back-to-back -back coexistence, but an active recognition of the right of the other person to share India's spaces, India's time and space together. And, and that is something which today is under threat. I will move on to India 2025 in a minute. But before I do so, I want to, to, to make one other very general observation. And that is this. We are today in India an extraordinarily short-termist people. We have become <coughs> formidably myopic. We are not able to think of the future except in terms of economic growth and in terms increasingly now and quite correctly in terms of strategic national interests, especially security. But barring India's GDP and India's security interests, Barring those two where we can take a long-term view and thereby help planners and policy makers to devise long-term plans and policies, we have essentially become extremely short-termist as a people and as a country. And nowhere is this more visible, nowhere is this more visible than on India's streets. Now, I live in Chennai. I must say, it is a huge relief for me to come to Kolkata and see, and some of you may wonder if I'm out of my head when I say this. When I see the relative absence of what in Chennai is called the motorcycle menace. 
there is in in Kolkata a markedly less occurrence of the motorcycle than in Chennai. There is in Chennai no road where you can walk, and I'm not talking as a as a as a person who is in, in a vehicle or who's driven around in vehicles, but as a pedestrian, where you can possibly proceed ten yards without being menaced by a motorcyclist. Now, what is the motorcycle today in India a symbol of? It is not the symbol of the fastest, most productive form of transportation. It is a symbol of a kind of aggression on the part of somebody who wants to just zoom ahead. It is a symbol of intense competitiveness. A competitiveness which is completely divorced from the rights of others, from the duties of oneself and the rights of others. I admire and respect the motorcycle for being a relatively economic form of transport, being used by relatively poor transport owners, vehicle owners, who require complete backing, provided they do not menace the woman and the child on the pillion and the person who is walking and very often other vehicles on the road. The motorcycle today in India is not so much a means of transportation as it is an expression of self-assertion. And a wonderful thing it is to have a sense of self-assertion, provided it does not mutilate others' security and indeed life. But this is what is happening. If the motorcyclist is menacingly self-assertive on the streets of India, uncaring of the rights of others, endangering his family and invariably the motorcyclist wears the helmet but does not provide it to his wife or to the, no, no need to provide it, probably no way to provide it to the child but doesn't really extend the same and he is wearing the helmet not because he wants to be sure of his own head but because he doesn't want to pay a fine. And this is not just a motorcycle matter. It is true of India as such. The rapacity of our mining lobbies, of our plastic lobbies, is no different. In fact, it is enormously worse. What are our mining lobbies doing in India? They are not only gouging the earth and disemboweling it of its minerals, which really belong to the whole country and are not meant to go into the private profit coffers of the miners. But they are doing so illegally. The biggest and the most scandalous examples of uh, daylight loot in the world, I think, have to be seen in the form of India's illegal miners. And by illegal miners, I don't mean the small man who scratches the earth and picks up something which is lying 10 feet below. No. But these are huge, huge cartels with the highest technology at their disposal, who are engaged in what they are doing illegally. But even those who are doing what they are doing legally, there is a kind of rapacity, uh, a, a, a mindless desire to earn the maximum profits in the shortest period of time. Likewise, the plastic lobby. And between the mining and the plastic, are smaller lobbies like the sand mining lobby. I do not know if there is such a thing, but I forget if there is such a thing in Western world. But river sand is today a very precious commodity. One would have never thought 15, 25, 20, 30 years ago, Sir Ashutosh would have never imagined river sand, the sand that lies in the riverbed or on the banks of it, would be a precious resource. Today it is because it is so vital to any kind of construction. And you will see in certain parts of India, rivers and riverbeds losing their shape because 
the sandwich has been just moved out. And who is it being moved out by? By the developers of our urban landscapes. Again, in a city like Chennai, <coughs> buildings have come up like pustules, as ugly as pustules, as dangerous to life as any ailment that erupts on the skin is, and completely devoid of ethics. Indeed, not just urban ethics, but any ethics. You have heard of, and I'm sure there are some students here from Chennai. Are there any students here who hail from Tamil Nadu? Can I see a hand up? Now, you must have heard or experienced the floods in Chennai about a few, a few weeks ago. Now, nature was the author of the deluge. But the copyright holder of the flood was not nature. It was the developer, the builder, the real estate, realtor of Chennai. It is that man who is the motorcyclist multiplied into one million, who wants to get where he wants to get as fast as he wants to get. And he has converted every flood bank, flood plain, river bank, marshland, waterway, temple tank, local pond into real estate prey and he is preying on land like a predator would prey on prey and this is what has really caused Chennai to become a concrete jungle which receives water but does not know how to absorb it because the outlets of rain water have become cement this is today's India, short-termist and therefore suicidal. What will India ten years from now be? And I'll share a few thoughts quickly perhaps. Do I have five minutes more or ten minutes? No. I, I, I will not go much beyond that. Because if, if I was in your seats, I'd be just chafing to leave this hall. Well, thank you. But I would like to dwell on Chennai for a moment longer. And that is this. Everything that happened in Chennai was because of the city. And I hold myself as guilty as anybody else, not because I am a developer or realtor, but because I have allowed that kind of thing to happen without any protest, no protest at all. And it is because we in the city of Chennai did nothing for the last 20 years to raise a squeak against what was happening, that today we have had to, we have had to go through what, what happened. And, oh my God, are you, this, is, it, is this, hap I can't believe it. Worst rainfall flood in a century, which is not statistically true either. Even in 1987, we had rains which were not so copious, but fairly strong. 87. Sometime in 58 also, we had, a, we had a very, very heavy downpour. Perhaps not so much as December of 2014, but bad enough. But it is today that we are able to just become completely marooned by ourselves. You have half a dozen of you laptops open in front of you. And I really hope you are all looking at something completely unrelated to what I am saying. Because if I were you, I would be doing so. But in case you are not, in case you are doing what I would be absolutely, you could knock me down with a feather if that is happening, which is transcribing my words of wisdom or my words of pearls into your laptop. If you are doing that, I would suggest please don't do that. It is just not worth it because you know what I am saying. But if you are doing something else, please go ahead and enjoy it. But that is exactly what we were doing in Chennai. We were so absorbed in our screens. We were so completely mesmerized by our own entertainment and our own self-entertainment that we did not know what we were doing to ourselves until the lights went out. Until 
the net went dead. The landline became a carcass. My mobile would not work, my phone would not work. I then became exactly what my great-great-grandmother and great-great-grandfather in Chennai were. Human beings who, if they wanted to reach somebody, had to walk to that person. No motorcycle menacing them. Only a couple of cows. But we got to where we, they got to where they wanted to get. We couldn't get because there was water. There was water up to and there was water. And I'm being very, shall I say, optimistic when I say there was water. It was not water. You can imagine what it was. It was everything except water. And it is not because you don't want your feet to get wet that you didn't want to walk on that. You didn't want to uh, be in um, what can be called a creative tactility with the vermin of the world. But that is what it was. And we were responsible. And where cement was not doing what it had done, plastic was doing what it was doing. I can blame the realtor for the cement, but I have only myself to blame for the plastic. But not just myself. Why is it that I throw my garbage on the street? Because I'm used to doing it. I'm used to throwing my banana peel on the street. But the banana peel was biodegradable. The plastic will last till time lasts. And it has now got into the arteries of our dreams. But behind my misuse of the plastic is the plastic lobby of India. I cannot understand, and I'm sure you will agree with me, why it is that this obvious, obvious to the child, obvious to the meanest intelligence, in fact, in, incidentally, I cannot understand this phrase, meanest intelligence, as if there's a gradation of intelligence, meanest, mean, less mean, more mean. <laughs> intelligence is intelligence. You can't have, like, in a certain state, there was an award for integrity. And how was that award calibrated? Outstanding integrity. Integrity of a high order. Integrity. <laughs> so like that, we can't have intelligence, less intelligence, mean intelligence. Intelligence is intelligence. So any intelligence would balk at the sign of our plastics. But there is another intelligence which is not intelligence but smartness. A kind of, shall we say, the naughty cousin of intelligence. And that naughty cousin of intelligence is also cousin to deceit, his uncle to fraud, his grand uncle or grand aunt to crime. The plastic lobbies of India, which include the Gutka lobbies, know that come election time, every party which wants to form a government, which wants to, to ban plastics, will need cash. And they will come to us. And we will be the suppliers of the cash. And they know that there may be a temporary order printed in poor English on cyclostyle paper, which is unreadable, banning certain microns of plastic bags. But that paper will disintegrate, but the plastic will stay. The plastic lobbies, the mining lobbies, are to Indian democracy what postpartum hemorrhage is to the Taj Mahal. Indian democracy is a Taj. But it is founded on this extraordinarily awful, hideous nexus between elections and cash. Cash comes in wholesale vehicles, like what used to be called cargo trains, you know, those very rusted, completely sealed up windowless carriages which used to go on train railway tracks and used to see them from the railway crossings. It comes in those bulks and then it comes in small jade sized packets, but cash comes. And we have, and you will all know this, company law, which says, Companies can donate to political parties. 
we have a very distinguished former law minister in our audience, Nishit Babu. How companies donating to political parties can sound a wonderful thing. Political parties need to campaign, and when they campaign, they need cash, and when they need cash, they have to turn to companies. How neat! It's almost like a nursery rhyme, perfect nursery rhyme, starting with once upon a time and ending with, and I must tell you, uh, my, my little granddaughter, whenever she cries in class, she's told, why are you crying? And she says, mama, and she's, the teacher says, why are you crying? Mama will come after lunch. So whenever she ends with a story which says, they lived happily ever after, she says, happily ever after lunch. <laughs> so it's something like that. Happily ever after lunch. Every political party is in need of cash. And the crying corporate sector knows that it's going to be happily after lunch. Lunch being the election. And they will then be in glow. I'm not saying I said I, I, I must modify that and take it back every corporate. No, there are great corporates and there are great companies which are not in this business. So this is not really a generalization that can be made properly. But there are a large number of corporates, a large number of companies which have used the company law provision to donate liberally. Many of them donate, make contributions to all parties like outstanding integrity, integrity of a high order, donation of outstanding donation, donation of a high order and plain donation. But they do donate. But what is the consequence? The consequence is that just as there is white money and black money, there is a check and then there is something which is not in a check. And it comes in another form. It comes as cash. So there is this phrase in Hindi. How many of you know Hindi in this audience? Oh, that's fantastic. This is called national, national integration. Hathi ke paam mein sab ke paam. So when the hathi ka paam has said company donations are fine, checks are fine, then in that paam, other paams come in, which, are not, which do not leave a footprint, which just merge in that large, huge paam. And so we have this enormous edifice of India's democracy, which rests on this extremely soiled foundation. I do not know what the answer is. If you were to ask me, so do we ban company donations to, to, to political parties? I wouldn't know, because today we are in a situation, even if we were to ban that, there would be cash flowing in any case. But I think a reform of election laws which insists on only that much and not more being spent, accompanied by an amendment of the Companies Act deleting the provision for company donations, can go a very long way in cleansing India's electoral democracy. If there are some people who win on a small budget, or those who lose not too badly on a small budget, election campaign budget, then I must say there is hope. My, my brother was contesting from New Delhi, not from New Delhi, sorry, but from one of the constituencies in Delhi on an ARP ticket for parliament. And I was in Delhi and I called on him just to offer my pranam to him before he was entering bat battle. And I saw him talking to an election, to his election agent. And he was telling him, and I'll say this in Hindi because all of you understand Hindi, most of you do. He said, Bhai sahab, aap dekhi, ye mein register laya hum. Jo bhi aap kharch karenge, aap isme likhenge. Mein auto mein jaunga, to mein aapko bataunga, mein kitna kharch kiya, wo aap isme likhenge. Mein postcard bhejunga, to aapko bataunga, wo aap, I knew my brother is not going to win that election. <laughs> if he is spending so much time on instructing his election agent on how to keep his accounts of autos and postcards, Raj Mohan Gandhi is not going to win this election, even in a time when there was a huge ARP wave. Of course he lost. But I think it is wonderful that there are people who will try to follow the rules. And incidentally he did not lose very badly. He lost by a fairly small margin. So there is hope. There is hope for Indian democracy. 
2025, 10 years from now, Atalji, uh, former Prime Minister, will be 101. His associate of many a long year, Advaniji, will be 98. In 2025, Dr. Manohan Singh will be 92. And by then, a former president, perhaps, but who knows, may not be a former president, may be president then too, Pranav Mukherjee will be 89. Now, I do not want to do the ages of active politicians because that might appear to place some in a relative advantage over others, although mortality, we know, is completely independent of chronology. <laughs> what I want to do is imagine the status of some institutions 10 years from now. And don't worry, there are only two sheets. First, our parliament. Between now and 2025, two general elections in 2019 and 2024 would have taken two general elections between now and 10 years from now. Will we have in 2025 a Lok Sabha of which at least one third are women? I believe we will. Sri Lanka has only 10 members, women members in the parliament of 225 and this in a country which is very, very uh, gender, uh, shall we say, wise. I think we will have a parliament of which one third are women. Will we have a Lok Sabha that has a Jarawa and Agarya from the run of Kutch, a transgender as an MP? Will we have Dalit MPs elected from non-reserved seats? Very probably yes. I sincerely believe yes. A Lok Sabha in which MPs have spent only that much campaign money as is allowed by the Election Commission of India? Certainly not. <laughs> a Lok Sabha that has no member with a criminal record? Alas, no. Will we have a Lok Sabha that is not adjourned many times a day because of MPs' unruly behavior? Definitely not. Why should we cavil at the motorcyclists running bizarre on the streets if the Lok Sabha has to be adjourned for unruly behavior? And this is about a Lok Sabha that will be in 2025, mind you, 73 years old. At 70 and a half, I'm a very senior citizen. 73 year old our Lok Sabha will be. But it will be a shock of such joy to me if it is a Lok Sabha that does not see unruly scenes. Next, our higher judiciary. Between now and 2025, will we have a credible procedure in place for the appointment of judges? I believe we will. I sincerely believe, despite all the the, the recent difficulties that we have been through, we will have a credible procedure in place for the appointment of judges. And if, to borrow the words of senior counsel Sriram Banchu, the appointment of judges follows the triple tenets of governance, which is transparency, participation, and accountability, virtues which the court itself pronounces and propounds, that procedure will give to the people of India an important reassurance. Will, by 2025, our honourable judges have been insulated from the lure of post-retirement appointments by the government of the day? I'm afraid not. As long as there are offices which can be offered to judges after they have retired, there will be the risk Reduced or not, there will be the risk that as the calendar approaches the crucial date, the judge may find his conscience in serious discussion with his intelligence. And our Supreme Court will, in 2025, be two years older than our Lok Sabha. It will be 75 years old then our executive. Between now and 2025, will the President and the Vice President of India be persons of independent stature, 
Women are men of some learning and much empathy, a little grace and much scholarship. I fear not. Will governors be appointed for their judicious bent and personal eminence? No. Will by 2025 a Lokpal have been added to the edifice of the nation state? Very likely, yes. I believe so. But will she or he enjoy the nation's confidence for impartiality, probity and guts? Unlikely. Will senior appointments in the bureaucracy be guided by ability rather than by loyalty? No. The bureaucracy itself will not let that happen. And our executive will not be 73 or 75. It will be as old as Chanakya himself. And finally, the public domain. Will we, by 2025, have a uniform civil code? We could. If yes, it will be for the wrong reason that majoritarianism would have prevailed. If not, it will again be for the wrong reason that purblind status quoism would have been conflated with minority rights. Will communalism, the antithesis of secularism and pluralism, have been reined in? It will not be. Would the death penalty have been abolished? I am afraid not. Medievalism will not let go of that toehold. Will there be a modicum of reform to curb vehicular traffic's insane behavior on our roads? Certainly not. First time vehicle owners and license holders will continue to treat driving as what I said. It is a form of self-assertion. And older men at the wheel will continue to give them fight. And older men like me walking on the pedestrian way, which is disappearing incidentally, will give up the fight. Our roads will be a greater nightmare than they are now. Will pollution levels come down, atmospheric decibel, visible? One would have to be a humorist or a spoofy to say yes to that. Will Swachh Bharat make a dent? It might. And I hope it does in some parts of major cities, but not all India. And the reason, as I said, the plastic, tetra pack and gutka lobbies can never be defeated in India as long as they remain one of the contributors to the election funds of our political parties. The plastic, tetra pack and gutka lobbies are their own Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. But why do I say Shiva? Because they will always allow a calibrated part of their product to be banned, resting assured that the fountain head is not touched. Will the Indian woman feel and be safer? Yes, I believe she will in our cities and bigger towns post Nirbhaya. But in our villages, the macho Indian male will continue to exploit mistreat and be violent with the Indian woman. India will, according to projections, overtake China's population by 2025. It will be a land of multiple chaoses, myriad tensions, of which the yawning divide between the rich and the poor will see unthought of consequences. Migrations of the rural dispossessed looking for work in the cities will have created a world record of sorts. India 2025 could, and you will all see it, I would have probably moved on to a less tense plane. India 2025 could well be the theatre of pandemics, a trapezium of zoonotic ogres, caused by the leviathan of callous living, and almost certainly the refusal of the state and society to heed seismic warnings and not adjust habitations to those, will see the most horrendous earthquake disasters of the Kathmandu type 
occurring in zone 4 of India's seismic map, endangering cities like Delhi, but not just cities like Delhi, through the direct impact of the earthquake, but also through what happens to nuclear power plants like Narora, which are located right next to Delhi. And what of Kolkata? Kolkata is not in zone 4, but Kolkata is likely to see if Amitabh Ghosh's predictions or projections or anticipations or wise foreseeings of climate change are true, the worst possible attention of unpredictable cyclones, storms and typhoons, which could extinguish the gap between the Shundarbon and Kolkata. And apart from giving us bizarre scenes like possibly the Royal Bengal Tiger swimming on Park Street, could also see the most unimaginable hazards, horrors and nightmares to life. This will not be because a particular government or a particular generation has failed, but because we as a people have just taken no notice of the extraordinary challenges of climate change. So obsessed are we with pointing a finger at others that we have been saying to the developed world, you fouled up the atmosphere, you clean it up, we are going our own way, without realizing that we are going to be the worst hit from climate change. We cannot prevent climate change as we perhaps should want to. We can perhaps mitigate the speed of climate change. But we can do things to adjust our forms of living and life in anticipation and wholesome anticipation of that, but we are not doing it. And thanks to IS, the nightmare of our times, terror will scar us deep and red. And yet, and with this I will say, say my leave, and yet, and yet 2025, will also see that most wonderful accomplishment of India, and I'm not referring to the <coughs> orbiting vehicle around Mars. India will see her republican spirit soar and make every passing political high weight swing like a leaf against the counterweight of public awareness. It will also see to it that the global war on terror does not hurl India into a local war within itself, communities pitted against one another. In a bizarre home version of that world war. For we are indeed, and with this I end, in the third world war. We should know that we are in the third world war. When President Hollande of France, who is today in Delhi, says France is at war, and the leaders of the governments of China, India, the US, Britain, Japan say, yes, we are with you in that war. The world is at war. We are at war with terror. But we should know that it is vital that while we fight this world war on terror, we do not create and generate a home version of that world war in the sense of communal antagonisms within our country. It is my confidence and my belief that India's republican spirit, not the number of spaceships flying India's colors in the sky, not its missiles or its nuclear submarines, not its giant malls and smart cities that will, despite all its woes, make us say, Thanks to the simple Indian man and woman in 2025, as before, what Rakesh Sharma said from his little satellite. You know what he said from his satellite when Indira Gandhi asked him, Aapko se Hindustan kaisa lag raha hai? I want to hear from you what he said. And that Hindustan will be ageless. I thank you.
chair lectures or endowment lectures uh, do not necessarily have any kind of uh, interaction session or question and answer series. Uh, but uh, there can be general interaction with the uh, Honorable uh, uh, Speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Gopalakshita Gandhi. Yes. For, for ten, yes. May I, may, I, may I just add to that to say that I asked Vice Chancellor when I came in and I saw about 20 people in the hall. I said, uh, is that it? Am I going to speak only to those who are present? He said, no, we, we actually, with, they made some lectures compulsory. So I was horrified. I, I really hope none of you are here because attendance to this was compulsory. <laughs> I am very sorry if attendance has been compulsory. And I really know I mean, there are a million things better than listening to a 71-year-old babble away on India 2025. And if that being the case, if attendance here has been compulsory, let me tell you, interaction is not at all compulsory. <laughs> You need not ask a single question or make a single question. So, may I take it that there is no comment and there is no question? There is. Then maybe we'll just take two or three comments. Yeah. I had a question regarding this language of war on terror that we have again revised in the context of ISIS. And given that war itself connotes an extraordinary situation, breakdown of civil liberties, and imposition of emergency provisions. Do we think that language of war is really helpful, especially when we see the destruction that the George Bush's war on terror brought about in various parts of Asia, which in many ways itself has led to the latest avatar of ISIS. Then perhaps isn't it better to avoid the language of war which necessarily leads to this me versus or us versus than sort of a dichotomy and probably may escalate off the fear of having further communal acumen at home as well. Thank you. I think that's a very important uh, observation, uh, sir. I would say war and the language of war are two completely different things. The person who indulges in the language of war, which is also known as demagoguery, is the person who is really trying to um, win the war before waging it. The war that is won and that is waged by a person who is on the right, who is in the right, is waged silently, effectively, with determination. And I cannot think of a more eloquent example of that than Lal Bahadur Shastri, our Prime Minister in 1965. He was not a demagogue. He did not speak the language of war as in the language of bullets. He said, Jai Jiva, Jai Jawan, and Jai Kisan. And when he said Jai Jawan, he was saying Jai Jawan. And he did not say Jai Jang, Jai Yuddha. He did not. And there is not one statement of his which can be found which said anything that was vicious about Pakistan. And he in Tashkand came to an extraordinarily brave agreement with the country that had suffered defeat at the hands of the Indian Army. So the language of war and war are two completely separate things. We have to be prepared for war on terror and not use the language of war at all. Because in any case, war is not fought with words. There's one question. relating to the media especially. So what essentially happened was that the media, especially print media, didn't take notice of it for quite some time and particularly until the Hindu stopped publishing the newspaper for one day and that marked history. So do you think at any point of time this whole nationalist perspective that many media houses today are trying to establish, say like the Times Now or NDTV, is actually lost and what is actually being portrayed as a nationalist perspective is sort of limited to certain pockets because something as vital as the floods and people losing lives in Chennai wasn't adequately covered as compared to a lot of other issues which were, com which were covered with that importance. 
you have raised more than one uh, important issue. I would say the lack of uh, national coverage of the floods in Chennai are not just about the media. There is, let us face it, let us be absolutely honest, and I am including myself in, in, in the, in the self-criticism. India that is Bharat actually is India that is Uttar Bharat. And there is no getting away from it. There is a huge wall of ignorance about anything south of Nagpur. I am not even saying south of the Vindhyas because that has become a cliche. If you were to ask a school child to plot the Vindhyas, find it difficult. But if you were to give a school child a chance, school child, I mean, I mean somebody in the 7th or 8th class, to say where is Nagpur, they may find it was bank centre. There is a great wall of ignorance about the south, in the north. So much so, that the north does not even realise that there is, apart from the south, something called the east and the west of India, which is not the north of India. <laughs> west Bengal and, and north east of India are not north India. There is no, no direction which has only one arrow going up and down north and south. It has many directions. I mentioned the Agariya, who is the dweller in the run of Kutch, where the wild ass roams. The Agarya is of no consequence in Delhi. But let us also be aware of another fact, that if the south is not known in the north, there is a south to the south of the south, which is not known in the south. And I refer to the Andamans. And there is a west, west of the Kutch, which lies in fellow Asians of the same stock in Pakistan, about whom we do not know. There is an east, to the east of Bengal, in the northeast. Why? In Darjeeling, about which we do not know enough. So it is a question, and I am so grateful to you for having raised this. It is much beyond, it goes much beyond what the media did to cover a particular flood. I take it, and I understand this, and I would grant this, that the newspapers and the, and, the, and the visual media can't be a, a daily encyclopedia of the national bulletin. I mean, they have to pick and choose. But there is definitely a north-centeredness to us as a people. Why do more Tamilians know Hindi than more Hindi-speaking people know Tamil? Why do more residents of Darjeeling know Bangla than Bengalis know Nepali? I am not saying all of us should know all the 23 languages or 32 languages of India. No. But some, some sensitivity to others around us. Just as two people sitting next to each other in, in an auditorium like this. Say two people sitting next to each other. Their immediate comments they will share to, with each other are like whispers into each other's ears. The man is talking nonsense. <laughs> I mean, how long do we hear this rubbish, this platitude? Why did the vice chancellor ask for this interaction? It's time for us. You see, we don't talk to our neighbors. Andhra does not talk to Tamil Nadu so much so that Andhra does not talk to Telangana. <laughs> we are neighbors in an auditorium. We love to whisper to each other and we should whisper to each other as long as we don't disturb the third person. And similarly, we must not whisper or slander, but must communicate with each other all the time, media most of all. One final. Yeah, yes. So thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. I've heard you when you were here for the conversation. Thank you so much for coming. My question is a reference to the parliament that you were talking about in 2025, and you were saying that a lot of marginalities come to be represented. So we have women, we would have indigenous people, we would have transgender persons there. And yet you said that the style of operation wouldn't change. So would this representation then be one, tokenism, two, you will not have critical numbers of, say, uh, marginalities who will change the modus operandi? Or will women, transgender, minorities, whoever is included, would have to play the same old game and, and, and hierarchies really don't change? So, so why did you say that in spite of representation, the, the, the overarch 
interesting style in which it is operative now that you are extremely critical of doesn't seem to change. So what's the point in having a more representative parliament if, if, if the representation of marginalities can't change the order of things? Thank you. Thank you. I think you made me think of that. Uh, but I would say an unruly parliament with better representation is better than an unruly parliament without better representation. <laughs> but also because, also because I feel better representation increases the chances of disorderliness and unruliness, by which I really mean lack of seriousness about legislation. That will change. And even these increased representation vignettes that we will see would be because of legislation and nothing else. And it is legislation that has brought them. Let us not, let us not forget that despite the fact that our legislatures have seen much unruliness, our legislatures, including state legislatures and parliament, have given us the most extraordinary laws. Take the RTI. The RTI came as a result of an agitation outside parliament. But it is now an act. Take the Environment Protection Act. Uh, Jairam Ramesh made this point yesterday in Kolkata that the Forest Conservation Act and all the other for pro acts pertaining to the environment have come in as a result of agitations outside but have become laws. And so the parliament has been instrumental in bringing in pioneering legislation. But it has also been the scene of vocal contestations and dramatics because of the short termism that I talked about in which the urgent becomes more important than the important. So the ability to take the urgent and the important together, to prioritize the urgent with the important, not forgetting the important when dealing with the immediate, and not forgetting today when thinking of tomorrow, that is a knack which I believe our legislators and parliamentarians must learn. And representation will probably have to encounter the difficulties that I mentioned but it will be better equipped for being better represented to tackle them. Maybe one more, <laughs> Chancellor. Yes, one. Sir, I belong to the state of Uttarakhand, where we are Uttarakhand. Uh, national uh, car dams, and uh, we recently had the Kedana tragedy. So, sir, me and my friends want to set up this uh, model of uh, smart villages, but we want to know your opinion as to how that smart village should be. And then second question of mine is, in your model of 2025, <coughs> where do you see the agriculture industry? Because when we say Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, we are forgetting our Kisans. So where is that Kisan in your 2025 model? Well, uh, may I also uh, take this chance to say that I am not offering a 2025 model. In fact, I am deeply suspicious of um, these formulas which pass as as uh, scenarios for the future and, and called models, de development model, alternative development model. I am very suspicious of those because I am, uh, I, I belong to a generation where uh, the only blueprint for anything that was made was what has been made. And the blueprint almost came after it had been done, but it had been done with some respect to natural resources. And on the subject of smart villages, I think, uh, uh, but I speak from ignorance. If you were to really ask me to say, to tell you what I know of a smart city or a smart village, I would not be able to, uh, to do so. Because I really do not, do not know what it makes, what it takes to make a city smart. I really don't know it. And I know that it is not just about cleanliness, but it is something much more technologically oriented than cleanliness or switch. It is something to do with speed, it is something to do with uh, communication, it is something to do with infrastructure much more important, or shall I say, in concession to your modernities in, in this audience, as important, if not much more important, as important as it is to make a smart village, is it to make a just village, a village in which the highs and lows of society are obliterated, as between men and women, women and children, men and children, between Sarpancha and Pancha, between the Sarpancha who rules through a proxy Sarpancha and ultimately in the matter of caste. It is much more important that a society, that a village be just than that it be smart. I was asked once by a great, Indi great Indian, or rather I was told by a great Indian, that his 
aim, aim is to make every Indian rich. It's a great aim. But richness is, apart from being relative, because somebody else is always richer, or some, somebody is less rich, it is also a very self-denying formula. Because there's much more that a person needs than just a square meal. As Munshi Premchand has told us, he starved to read in order to be able to read. So a village that is just is, I think, as important as a village that is starved. And no village can be just that ignores the, re the requirements of the peasant community, which is an important part of the farming community. And when we talk of the farmers, we must remember that the farmer is a farmer is a farmer. There is an agricultural labor. There is a peasant. There is also the fisherman, who according to Professor Swaminathan is also a farmer. And so the person who creates that with which people eat and, and find their nourishment has to be at the heart of every Indian planning. And the farmer community in India in demographic terms is astonishingly less in the last census than it was in the previous census. Our population has increased. But can you imagine that in India, farming population has reduced in size? Incredible. So I have no model. I have just some dreams and some fears. In a sense, uh, it is a continuation of uh, the great message of our, our uh, father of nation, Mahatma Gandhi. It is that uh, every social transformation occurs on the basis of uh, the anger against uh, oppression, evil, and uh, non-cooperation with the, any of uh, the oppressor. Change of heart of uh, the oppressor and cooperation, participation by the oppressed community. All these uh, in a concerted manner only can uh, result in a, a desirable social transformation. Many of uh, the answers uh, that uh, he has uh, given are uh, reflecting uh, this uh, great ideology. Now it is uh, the time for uh, felicitating uh, our uh, honorable uh, guest. Always the pleasure, and it's also today. We have Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi, and he has not disappointed us. Well, after such a brilliant speech, I don't transpire to say anything more except to say that his message is not one of prediction but uh, expectations what is likely to be. May I hope. The things that he has thought would endure, have been enduring this uh, older civilization still subsisting, will continue. Taj Mahal representing more than a building, our democracy, the spirit of tolerance, these are things and hope in another eight years or so which remain would endure. So may I also say that taking in a different context, the name in whose name this lecture is being held, Sir Ashutosh Mugaji talking about law, had said both its aspect of continuity and change. I hope that good things will continue, then the things which require to be altered will disappear, and then we live in hope, hope that happens actually. Thank you very much again, Mr. Gopal Gandhi, for being here.
on behalf of the university uh, it's my privilege and honor to offer a vote of thanks first of all of course to mr gopal krishna gandhi as justice mukherjee has very rightly pointed out we were all very keen to hear mr gandhi his erudition his dreams his visions of india in 2025 of course he didn't offer us a model but his dreams i am sure all of us do share and all of us do cherish and we assure you sir all of us here would aspire to live up to your expectations of the ideal citizens that india 25 india 2025 will see we thank you for coming to nujs yet again and we hope to have you in future may i also offer my humble uh, vote of thanks to justice honorable justice jitutosh mukherjee he has been a father figure for this institution and it is so befitting the occasion that the ashutosh chair lecture is presided over by him thank you again sir i would like to thank honorable vice chancellor professor ishwar bhat professor bhat has been the guiding force for this chair as well as for many other activities in this university and yet again we have managed to have such a intellectually stimulating talk by mr gandhi and we hope to see we hope to hear many other dignitaries in future i would like to thank the administration the university administration everyone everyone in dashutosh chair dr bikram ji de shubhangi and everyone else who have pulled off this event and pulled off all the other events of dashutosh chair for the last one whole year finally a big word of thanks to my colleagues all the guests and all the students who have come here have been so patient and who have asked so intellectually stimulating and interesting questions thank you all of you thank you very much